Hello everybody, it's me, Get Daved, and let's have a channel update. So, we're about to finish this war of mine. I won't say how many more episodes, but uh, we're getting close, and it will be time for a new Let's Play. Now, the Patreon, uh, it went down a bit. It's kind of stabilized a bit. Uh, if you are a Patronus and you want to tell me anything, send me a message. Or if you're thinking about it but don't want to, send me a message. You know, I'm down with whatever. The goal of this was to help with other things, which we'll get to. Um, anyway, one of the things that I was going to do, which we hit, was to do another Let's Play now of a, of a series I'd already done, because I've got better equipment now, and good games are still good games, and maybe we want to revisit them. So, number one was Master of Orion, but a lot of people were also sort of saying we should play Wargaming.net's new version of the game. And I want to spend the majority of this time talking about it. I'm just going to quickly address the runner-up, which is what I'm actually going to do. Chrono Trigger. So that's going to be coming very shortly. I want to spend all of the rest of this video talking about the new thing, the new version of Master of Orion that's coming out. So it's not a remake of Master of Orion 1. Having looked at it, they sort of pitched it that way originally, but I've been following this pretty closely. It's on Steam Early Access, but not the form of Early Access that you can get yet. You can't buy it. As soon as that happens, I'm going to be in there. So I'll be doing both. This is almost more like Master of Orion 3, because there was no Master of Orion 3. Is that clear, everybody? There wasn't a third game. It never happened. What we have is this one, and they're incorporating some stuff from Mu 1 and Mu 2. And it really is going to turn out to be a new game. So, and you might not be into this, maybe you will, but I just kind of want to go through the entire website with you. I'm serious. I was reading this the other day and I was like, you know, I'd like to share my thoughts and I'd be really interested in what you people have to say. And you know what I mean when I say you people. So they've got some dev diaries. By the entire site, I'm not including the entire news section, but you can sort of look through there. They have sort of like five to ten minute videos, just a couple of them going over, you know, them noticing like that the IP was for sale and they nabbed it up right away and got some of the original design team together to recreate the game. Um, they seem mostly inspired from Master of Orion 1, but uh, yeah, 2 is factoring in there to the point that this is going to be a unique game, like the other ones. Unlike Master of Orion 3, the original one, which was genuinely not really like its predecessors. Like, it was only sort of superficially similar. It was a lot more like filing taxes than it was like playing Master of Orion. So, I'm going to go over the races they've got in here. They're not all being shown quite yet. Fight for the meek, crush the weak. Weakness and meekness are related, so I'm wondering if there's some problems with nuance with their... Uh, philosophy. We've got our nice Bear Claw logo. I actually want to skip back to these guys real quick. This is the Terran Con 8. If you're familiar with 8 million episodes of Star Trek where they have like an alternate continuity um, where it's the, the Terran Empire instead of the Human Federation or whatever. This is basically who we're dealing with. They're like through the mirror darkly versions of us. Kind of similar. They are born of blood and war, leaving them unable to move past the traumas of their development. Don't know what they see, or don't know what that means, but all they see is war. So we've got the aggressive humans. They're diplomats, but in the way that they declare war and use people. So, during the time when humanity was suffering through the domestic war that left millions dead. Okay, so they are some sort of split off. Roast power, okay. Genghis Khan becomes leader. Desperate times call him for desperate measures. And then they established a caste system. All right. I wonder where they live. They intend to use their power to guide the errant races to the path of strength or the will of the Khan. <laughs> you know, whichever works. Wow. So, Purge. That's alright. 
you have to get the collector's edition. That's okay. They're a new race being added to the game. They're basically humans. That's fine. So this is being remade. Oh yeah, do we have the ship? It's just the same as the normal humans right now, I think. Slightly different color scheme, but it's vaguely Enterprise-like. We've got, you know, your primary hull, you know, what's basically warp engines, and then a bum. It's it's like the very common template of the... So Paramount owns, like, a trademark on the the Enterprise look. So you have to change at a certain point. It's like on Conan's talk show where they have like songs that sound like these songs but legally aren't. And they'll start like playing Stairway to Heaven Almost. Okay, we got the Bulrathi. So bear people. With Master of Orion 3, they wanted to formalize and like add legitimacy to like the hard sci-fi aspect. Again, because their ideal was spreadsheets and paperwork and a game that played itself. You can actually win just by hitting turn. You don't have to do anything, really. Um, anyway, in Mu 3, one of the things they wanted to do was get rid of all of the sort of derivative aliens, which basically means no cat people, no bird people, no bear people, um, you know, and nothing that is basically just a knockoff of something that appeared in Star Trek. Because Bulrathi are... They're bear people, but they were also also kind of Klingons, so... Anyway, they're back! They may care for the welfare of lesser creatures and the well-being of planets, but they're still a hot-hated and aggressive race. It starts many intergalactic brawls. Super Smash Bros. fans. Brio Conquerors. So they're a super good thing, if you're unfamiliar with the series. Not sure why you're watching this. I guess I suckered you in with the channel update. And now we're just talking Master of Orion. But anyway... They um, are really good at ground combat. Very, very good. So if they come to invade one of your planets, you're in a lot of trouble. At the end of the day, they only respect those who can match them in battle and those who do not back away from adversity, like fighting them. The Bolrathi Emperor exemplifies the contradictory nature of the Bolrathi, noble protector and ruthless destroyer. He's a dictator. All right. Their homeworld is Ursa. So, when they were making the lore for this game, they looked back on, like, everything that had been written for Master of Orion 1, 2, and 3. And when 3 was coming out, I followed its development very closely. <laughs> and they tried to come up with a canonical explanation for why you kept starting the game in the same sort of state. So, basically, at the end of Master of Orion 1... Uh, basically everyone gets an arts degree, you know, utopia, intergalactic utopia is established by wiping out everyone else. Everyone gets an arts degree and then it's just sort of a period of hedonism on their own success. And then all the other colonies die out. <laughs> anyway, that's what they tried doing. So the lore writer for this one she read all of this stuff and sort of constructed a new formalized canon from it and it's it's interesting anyway so you're gonna see the background of like a lot of war-torn histories and i guess because that's also a really safe thing to say very few societies don't have some form of war problems eventually small band of scientists wow they terraformed their own planet. Oh, and then they lost it. Okay. So they closed the ozone hole and reversed global warming is what I'm hearing. And we'll kill anyone else. <laughs> All right then, good stuff. Out of war, peace. Not sure what that means either. That's really ominous. Don't hang with that person. Also, we'll take a quick look at the schematic for the Bulrathi ship. Kind of interesting. I saw these and thought they kind of had a hangar bay look to them because this is presumably the front of the ship. So I don't know if they're going to add fighters or not. They're the underdogs, even when they hold great power and influence. 
I'm the victim. They act as if they do not care who likes them, yet are highly motivated by the opinions of others. They're... They're teenagers? <laughs> they desire intergalactic respect on the political stage, yet are constantly beset by internal conflict. <sighs> no one gets us. However, they are united in the fear that their race may one day be exterminated. Yeah, I mean, we can all get behind that. A little paranoia. Uh, protection of the people is the strongest motivating factor, perhaps reflecting their aptitude for researching shields in the original Master of Orion game. The long-suffering homeworld has been on the brink of destruction more time than the humans can count. Oh. Yay. Especially those of their own making. <laughs> Whoops. By the time the humans became concerned with their actions and began the unified effort to save Saul, it was too late, and the planet was set on a course of decay. <laughs> In their time of dire need, the Bulrathi made a chance encounter. Did they share terraforming with us? Oh. I'm not sure why they would show that kindness, but anyway. Presidents are elected for eight-year terms and are served by their many consultants, political groups, and lobbyists. All advisors from the chiefs of staff who oversee the combined human military efforts to the Xeno Relations Council. Go on. A focus on international affairs of diplomacy. Wouldn't it be interstellar? Are focused on making the human race a force to be truly reckoned with in this intergalactic age. Cool. Alright, so humans are um, unable to save themselves, is what we've gleaned from them. Alkari. They're uh, one family under the gods. They're kicking it Game of Thrones style. Desire to be the greatest warriors in the galaxy. So, in the original, they had high evasion, and they were also had a high degree of initiative in combat. So, there you go. They have a pantheon of gods, cool stuff. The god of sky, oh, patriarchal, of course, Skriak, often referred to as the father of Alkari. It's interesting that this one's so far kind of about the religion. The gods resemble the various breeds of Alkari and watch over specific realms of Alkari life. Voltaire would be pleased. Their homeworld, Altair, is rich in artifacts due to ancient and well-documented history of the Alkari. So that's a Mu 2 addition to sort of try balancing the races they added the artifacts component. However, long before the Alkari were the dominant race on their planet, Altair was a thriving Orion outpost. So, artifacts. Also shows the guiding hand that pushed the Alkari from their earliest evolutionary development. Then how did their religion deviate from that is what I want to know. Early centuries of Alkari civilization were dominated by vicious internal warfare between the great families of Altair. The years of warfare finally ended when the first Sky Lord, who stars in the movie Guardians of the Galaxy, united the families of all breeds to create the Alkari government. It like sounds super badass, and then he's like, and then we formed the prequel trilogy to Star Wars. The Alkari thrived under his generous dictatorship, witnessing revolutionary boosts in production, technology, and cultural achievements. The Alkari are now a dictatorship-style government called The Flock, which is a great band name, probably, which is still ruled over by a highly respected Sky Lord. The Alkari are a proud race which do not look upon offense with mercy. Do not look upon offense with mercy. I'm not sure if they're talking about tactics for their sporting franchises or if it's okay to offend them or not. Anyway, they're scrappy. And they're good at propulsion and stuff. And they have, I think, a really cool ship design, actually. I don't know. Got a regal quality to it. The Sakura. They are good and bow before us or fall. Great talk. So we've got the lizard people now. Aggressive, competitive race that fight to survive on crowded planets with little room for formal laws. Go on. They're a physically imposing race that are determined to prove themselves as worthy adversaries against any opposition in the galaxy. The strong are the only ones who survive on slaw. Which is crazy because their thing is population growth. The only way to stand out in the massive soccer population is to show great strength and defeat any challenges, challengers to your claims. The mother god and father god bore the first generation of Saki Sakura. 
many millions of years ago. That's kind of how it works. These first children formed the oldest tribes, which they still claim ancestry from. Yet mom and dad were so controlling <laughs> that the first tribes uh, under a hierarchy battle. Okay, wow. Oh, they just don't get me. Three days, the gods were dead, and the Sakura had united victoriously under their first hierarch. Wow. They finally remember the destruction of their own creators. Whoever they were long ago, it was the Antarans. Government of the Sakura is a feudal system composed of various tribes headed by a hierarch which represents them on the intergalactic stage. This does not sound like a stable society. No one walks away peacefully and regime changes are an especially bloody time in Sakura civilization. I wonder if they're going to add some sort of like vulnerability to sabotage or something like that in this one. And a lifetime of internal warfare on their home planets. The Sakura have a massive population which continues to grow at exponential rates. New planets are necessary to support their population. They sound like they're going to collapse under their own weight. It does not seem like a stable society. Kind of a lizard-like ship as well, like the scales almost. Fins. Because lizards have fins. <clears throat> Death in battle is the greatest honor. Sexy cat lady with three fingers. Elegant, rebellious, cat-like creatures. They like art. Flawless personal style. They'll get your steez fixed. Super intelligent, feudal government. They have an empress. This is interesting. Yeah, they're sort of like warrior poets, the race. The philosopher kings. Except they're all queens. No mention of male Mercians, really, and everything. So... I guess all we can assume is that it's a matriarchy. Um, they have good accuracy, so a master of Orion won. The Alkari were very good at dodging, and the Mercians were really very good at attacking in space ships. So that's being persisted here. It was slightly muted in Master of Orion 2, where the Alkari were really good at dodging, and that was like a plus 50% to their evasion. Mercians had a plus 50% to their accuracy, and the way the formula worked in that game, those sort of didn't quite balance each other out. So this skill was much less useful in Master of Orion 2, and they had sort of Warlord traits added onto it. This is a pretty good combo. Warlord's really good. You can kind of see, it kind of reminds me of like a, a cat's claw, like where they can retract into it. I'm getting sort of a paw-like vibe from it. That's good art direction, folks. And the Darlock. Oh no, we got one more after that. Not all of them are being shown on the website right now. They struggle to understand what is real in the universe. So they're shapeshifters, and they're paranoid, and they don't have solid understandings of reality as you might expect from what they like sort of one with a plastic ability of representing it operate on a dictatorship dictatorship called the cabal ruled by their hindmost he's an nsa agent oh the things they would have done to mr snowden excessively paranoid and xenophobic but they all sort of like grudgingly cooperate i guess and like terrorist cells uh, a cool thing is in the game, when you go to the diplomacy screen, they like will actually reference their own lore and everything. Like he'll sort of be talking about, oh, the hindmost will be pleased. It's cool stuff. I don't really get this other than I kind of see like the peak of a Darlock's head, because they sort of have that Corian Mass Effect 2 kind of thing on top. It's very miter hatish. One interesting thing is. Um, they changed basically everyone's personal logo, except the Cylons, which is more or less unchanged since they came up with logos for all the races from Master of Orion 2. So it's a fun little quirk. They're eggheads. These are the nerds. Research. So they were really good at um, researching everything, which was their special thing. I don't know if they originally generated research points. No, no, they had a 50% bonus. So they did generate research faster as well. 
in this one they basically have autism they're like benedict cumberbatch from the imitation game did he have was it autism he had either way they like yeah are awkward at parties but don't really have empathy i guess like they don't naturally understand the relationships between other people and like non-obvious social cues yeah so they got like a bit less cool i guess because before it's like they're just really smart now it's like yeah they're really smart but inside it is a world of poverty just nothing but math and pretty cool classic ufo style ships actually I wonder if it's going to be tied to flag color. It looks like it's all tied to race now, which I really like. Got some sample screens. So one really significant change is they've switched to a galactic civilization style tech tree and like civ. Um, the original master of Orion sort of had a list of techs in each area and they had a level associated with them. And you could always see a little bit ahead to like future levels so you would sort of skip from one and then you could research the other and then maybe you could skip ahead a little bit further and it was randomly generated every time so different ones would be removed if you were the Cylons fewer would be removed and they could see further ahead so you could skip more often if you wanted to you would always be able to research ones you skipped but you know the, the the later ones would still cost more so it wouldn't save a ton of time it's not a system like an endless legend where you know researching fewer texts is actually maybe advantageous anyway we've got some branches and stuff too i don't really yeah it looks like they do have at least at this stage in development they're planning on having tech lines that require different uh, paths. So in the original, you, you would also research six texts synchronously and you could control these sliders to determine how much, like how you were distributing your research basically. Um, it looks like it's more like Master of Orion 2 or Galactic Civ or Civ where you sort of pick one and that's where all of your research points get dumped. That was also a pretty legitimate strategy for a Master of Orion 1. When you were in a hurry, it was the way to go. One other note, Oh yeah, uh, they changed how the verbiage goes for planets. Um, basically, there's no small anymore, but there's like medium, large, huge, and gigantic or something. And gigantic's actually between large and huge, I think. Anyway, they still have four sizes. Everybody starts on a large one, so it all kind of boils down to the same. What is kind of interesting to me is it looks like they sort of have the idea of a law of diminishing returns on production and food and stuff, which is actually a really good idea to make, um, well, just to limit the exponential nature of production growth, which I think has always been a problem in Master of Orion games. It can really get out of control quickly, and it makes having a bigger empire too good. Like one good planet early in the game and you can get like a couple more plants than everyone else and you've basically locked down victory at that point because you're the way the production cascades forward and everything it's too powerful got a beautiful new galactic map looks like they might be doing something with star lanes as well that's yet to be seen though so star lanes were only introduced in master of orion 3. what i'd kind of like to see is you can go anywhere you want but once you go somewhere the path like because it gets mapped you can take the same route a little bit faster and that would make it worthwhile to explore like different systems from different paths and it would give you sort of a concept of infrastructure i don't know if they're going to do that but it'd be fun um there was one other really significant thing i wanted to show off let's just cycle through these real quick got buildings like in master of orion 2 which is why I maintain it's going to be a new sort of game. There we go. Workers. Looking not unlike um, Star Drive 2, actually. Really nice interface, though. Good execution of flat design, everybody. So, unlike 
Orion one where it was controlled by gauges. We've got individual uh, units. And again, it looks like it's also based around building construction rather than the generic factory construction in Master of Orion 1. It'll be an interesting combo. And I don't know uh, how a bunch of this other stuff is going to go. Looks like it's a good mix of Master of Orion and the interface, like a lot of the interface innovations from Endless Space as well. I don't know. I'm optimistic because this is very Fids like but I mean, Fids was ultimately kind of ripping off Master of Orion, so good. Everybody's standing on the shoulders of giants. What else do we have? An interesting star rating system. The planets are rated by, like, biome quality now, so, like, Gaia-class planets are grade A, Terran and Ocean are grade B, and so on. Uh, that was already implicitly in place, so I'm glad they're just being a bit more official, because there was, you know, some there was a ranking system and it was pretty transparent, especially in Master of Orion 2 once you started terraforming. Looks like diplomacy is slightly more complicated than before. Don't know what this embassy stuff is. Share charts is, of course, your maps. Hmm. Darlocks. Never trusted Darlock. I've never trusted Darlocks and I never will. There we go. I think I sort of hit over all the main things I wanted to work on, or wanted to talk over. Um, I'm excited to play this. As soon as the game comes out, I'm going to be hammering at home. Thanks for watching this. I'd really be interested to see what you guys have to say. Are you excited about it? Do you think they're going to do a good job with it? It seems they have the right degree of reverence, but you need more than good intentions. And I'll see you all in the next episode. Thanks for watching.